Welcome to Scotch Watch's podcast. On the show today, Only Watch finally pulls the plug on their 2023 watch auction. More on that, we might have been right. Nixie Tubes make a comeback on the wrist. Fears unveil a couple of new releases that will blow your mind. Tons more new watches, plus loads more, including a behind the scenes interview with a very famous watch designer. All that and more on the show today. But first thing we should probably do is crack on with a new watch that is using some very old technology. Nixie Tubes are something that were used many many decades ago they were kind of outdated by the time VFD displays came along that you remember from your VCR from the 80s and 90s but they're making a bit of a comeback the steampunk era is definitely appearing on the wrist and I've seen a couple of these watches in the past Steve Wozniak co-creator of Apple is a big proponent of them but they've always been really expensive because the stock items used are like hen's teeth extremely rare difficult to pin down but there's a company out there that is making these futuristic super cool wrist models Monsters. Have you had a look at this one, Dave? And what do you think? I have had a look at this one. And funnily enough, you mentioned that I've got a Nixie Tube watch that should be here in the next few months that I ordered, oh, two years ago nearly. And it has been held up because, as you mentioned, these tubes are pretty much out of date, it has to be said. And uh, if I remember rightly, Ukraine was one of the big producers of them, which was obviously back in the day part of the Soviet Union, of the Behind Iron Curtain. Obviously things have changed significantly today and there's a whole nasty situation going on there and that's held up these a little bit. But yeah, the a lot of the Nixie tube supplies seem to come from either Ukraine or from Russia. This is the Gelfman IN16 Nixie and it's pretty cool, I have to say. Very similar in terms of the one that I've gone for in terms of layout and stuff, but I guess there's only so much you can do when you've got two Nixie tubes that you have to incorporate into it. Maybe we should explain for everybody listening at home what a Nixie tube is. Nixie tubes were invented by a guy called David Hegel Barger. I believe that's how you pronounce it. And they were first introduced by a company called Burroughs Corporation back in 1955. Essentially, it is a vacuum tube technology that is used. So uh, you may have seen vacuum tubes used in old school audio devices as well. And back in the day, they were used in early computers. They were used by the military in these kind of early rudimentary supercomputers, if you want to call them that as well. Really fell out of favour when lots of more advanced display technologies came along, whether it was cathode ray tubes, whether it was moving into LEDs and OE LEDs and all these different types of panels. Obviously, they surpassed this technology quite quickly. But what does Nixie stand for? People think it was a bit made up or it was something just plucked out of the ether, but it actually stands for Numeric Indicator Experimental Number 1 because they very much were experimental technology. This one that we're talking about here though, this uh, IN16, the cool thing about it is going to be that it also has some modern technologies. You can use your computer to control things like the back colour lighting on it and a few other features. So it's maybe not quite as rudimentary as it would have been back in the day when Nixie Tube was was the in-fashion technology. Not seen one in real life of this one, but it looks by all accounts that all of the kind of manufacturing of the case is up to what you would expect for a premium watch. And it should be, as this one's going to come in, around about the €7,000 mark. So definitely not a, a, a pocket money purchase, but something that's going to be a little bit different. And for sure, you're not going to see many of them out there. Pretty limited edition. I think maybe only 100 pieces on this one. I'm going to think that Ricky likes this. I've always loved the look of them. Ever since I saw a video from Techmoan on YouTube, quick plug for him as well because his channel is phenomenal, he will take the most boring subjects, even more boring than wristwatches, and be able to succinctly talk about them for maybe 30-40 minutes. And it could be anything, it could be the world's smallest recording device, everything, everything from there forward. And he's had on Nixie clocks and Nixie tubes in the past, and they do look so futuristic. The price is a little bit steep. Again, 7K, that's... I'm trying to think what else you could get around about that look, that feel. Maybe a Devon Tread, something like that. But this is the steampunk, futuristic, resto mode version of an MBNF. Yeah, to be honest, is the price punchy? I guess it depends what you're comparing it against. It's neither a mechanical watch. It's, I guess, early digital if you want to call it that, but it's kind of analogue at the same time. It's very much quite unique, it has to be said. There's very few Nixie tube watches out there. 
for no other reason than there's not a lot of Nixie tubes out there. I don't even know if anyone actually produces them to this day or whether these really are all new old stock items that have been used for them as well. There's probably zero need for anyone to produce them and the cost of producing a handful for a watch would be ludicrous in terms of cost. So I think in some respects the price is not unfair. It just has to be the thing for you. And if this is your thing and you're into your watches and you like something that is made as well as any watch probably at this price point, then it's probably a fair price to pay. If it's a bit of a toy for you, it's a, it's an expensive toy. Yeah, I never said it was shit. I just said it was a little bit pricey. Probably agree with you for no other reason than the one I've gone for is significantly less than this, albeit still not, you know, entry-level G-Shock money or Swatch Watch money by any accounts, but it's about a third of the price of it. At that price point, yes, that is still a considered purchase. Let's not make any bones about it. A couple of grand is a couple of grand, but that is easier to swallow. I mean, even last year when the Mad One Red came out, if that had been seven grand, I probably would not have gone for it. And that has got horological putts because it comes from MBNF Mad Galleries. But this one, I like the look of it. And if you like it, buy it. It is cheaper than a whole host of other watches out there. If you've got the money, you like it, buy it. You can always sell it on. You might not get all your cash back, especially with an unknown brand of unknown origin, unknown heritage. But hey, we're here to have fun. And this is an extremely fun hobby. Well, this is the part of the show where I stop talking and I introduce someone that actually knows what they're talking about. And we've got a guest that has been involved with Scottish watches for a number of years, behind the scenes, not in the forefront, not in front of camera, but back of house. And he is, well, I'm actually going to get him to talk about himself, introduce himself and explain why he is here today. So special guest, who are you and what do you do? Uh, I'm Will Brackfield. I'm uh, one of the designers at Christopher Ward. To give people a little bit of background on yourself and how we know each other, it must have been two and a half years ago we first started speaking, thanks to Mike Frant, to Christopher Ward. And the reason for that was we were coming up with the designs for the C63 Highlander. That was a massive success. Even to this day, I'm constantly tagged in wrist checks on Instagram and Facebook groups because people genuinely love the watch. And then more recently, for our Every Watch auction, you guys had a customised one-of-one version of that that attained a very lofty price within the auction itself. A great charity. And it was nearly, or it was actually over $70,000 was the grand total that was given to that charity at the end of it. So congratulations to you and the guys there for that one. We're not here to talk about that watch. We're here to talk about something else today. And this could be the third album. We've spoken about 12. We've spoken about Bel Canto. And now we've got something else that is sneakily on the wrist here. So give us the run through. What exactly is this lump of metal adorning my wrist today? Okay, so that's the new C1 moon phase. It's an iteration on uh, the moon phases that we've done in the past, but updating it and adding a few new special touches. For those people that might not know, uh, we've we've done a moon phase watch for quite a while now, um, which is our own in-house module. Uh, so developed in-house uh, with a Solita base, um, and it's one of the very few perpetual moon phases. So rather than just clicking once a day, the moon is always moving. And for this new uh, moon phase, we have done something a little bit special and decided to take almost everything off the dial and make the dial out of a venturine. Now, that is a big point because I have, behind the scenes, been taking this on a walk. This has been on wrist for a few different things I've been doing. And I know that your bosses and paymasters will absolutely hate the fact because this is embargoed and no one should get to see it. But I like breaking the rules and I wanted to test it on an unsuspecting public. So I went out and about with this watch on the wrist and when I was out and about I wanted to get the impression from people that saw it and the first thing was I would ask people what do you think of this watch and everyone said that's amazing is that the new Moser is that the new Arnold and Son there was a whole host of different names people came out with because you as you said it's such a clean dial you've let the hands the moon phase and the adventuring dial sing you haven't overloaded it with all the stuff that other brands would do, or historically you guys have done in the past with prior iterations of your moon phases. So this, again, is a win, and that's why I said at the beginning there, this could be the third album, the biggest, greatest, well, it is, it's massive, the biggest, greatest hit so far. So tell us, what is the differences? And you said there, it is constantly in motion. It doesn't just click over day by day. I don't know much about moon phases. I don't actually own one yet. 
this could be the first. So tell us what the differences are then for everybody, including myself, that doesn't know. So a lot of moon phases work similar to kind of date disks where they are just they click every day, whereas this one is constantly moving a tiny little bit, something that our module does. And it just adds a little bit of kind of romance to it rather than it being kind of very digital and just just click across. Maybe going back to the Aventurine dial and the fact that it's so clean, um, we definitely started off with a dial that had a lot on it. Um, and we did what we would usually do and added some kind of nice markers, well finished. And we just kind of felt like you've got that amazing Aventurine dial and you've got so much life in the dial. You're kind of adding things for adding things sake and it became too cluttered. Another reason why we decided to take marks off completely is we wanted to have a double stacked Aventurine. So you'll notice that obviously the, the dial is Aventurine, but then the, the moon disk is also Aventurine. Now, that's not something many people do. Um, I think mostly because on Aventurine dials with moon phases, the moon phase aperture is quite small. So the fact that it's not Aventurine also, you don't really see it. But when you have an aperture so large, we tried it with just a printed kind of blue color matched disc and it just doesn't work as soon as we decided we had to do the double stack so aventurine being a glass has a minimum thickness that you can create a dial or a, a moon disc out of so if you double stack it and then add markers on top you end up adding quite a considerable amount of thickness to the watch now the watch being a modular watch it's obviously got the base movement and the module on top which doesn't lend itself to being the thinnest watch to start with so you don't want to stack too many things on top of it so it was kind of a a win-win taking the markers off and kind of letting the the aventurine and the moon kind of sing on their own well while you were talking i did pop this off the wrist just to see the thicknesses we're talking about and i hadn't noticed it was thick at all I mean, we can see on the video here or in the show notes if you want to play along at home, there is that disc cutout. But when you look at it face on, even in pretty strong light, it takes a while for you to notice that there is actually that aperture there. So were there any problems in using that double methodology? Did you run into any inconsistencies between the colours or the way it looks? Because to me, it looks fantastic. In terms of matching them, it's fine because it's cut from the same piece of glass. So you get quite a good, consistent coverage. Doing that means that because it's every piece is different, you don't get, you get some pieces that have more star, more kind of fleck in it, some with less, and picking the right pieces and making sure they're they're kind of matched well was a challenge. But also cutting the inventory, and as I said before, it's glass, and you'll see on the side of the aperture, the the radiuses get quite tight. So cutting tight radiuses in something like glass can be quite tricky, and if you don't quite get it right, you can crack it. So that was something we had to work on for quite a long time to make sure that we could produce these in in the numbers we needed to and yeah keep the quality high this is something we've chatted about recently on the show and that is the problems creating dials with funky materials like grompo enamel and how they can crack at any point in time uh we've spoken about lots of different things sapphire being utilized in the different stages we had probably your friend and my friend rich from studio underdog telling us of the issues there we've had all kinds of people crying their eyes about how difficult it is to work with glass-like technologies within wristwatches and cutting them and hoping nothing goes wrong when they're affixed but no this is absolutely incredible so for the tech heads amongst us me included can you tell me about modules because you guys are known for the bel canto module jumping hour modules you've done things with fears just about a year ago what is the, the background because Christopher Ward are seen as the guys that will give you value for money, but more and more now, you are the guys that will bring technical excellence to the wrist for pocket money prices. So it was something that got started maybe about 10 years ago with uh, Johannes Janke, who used to be our head uh, of technical development in Switzerland, and he kind of wanted to add complications to watches that maybe weren't available or the version that he had imagined wasn't available. So obviously something like a moon phase has been around for a long time, but creating a moon phase with a, a huge aperture like you see on the on the moon phase uh, that you've got on your wrist isn't something that's openly available. It's not something you can buy from Solita. So having the ability to add those modules on top and customize what you want to do with the functions is is quite important. 
And um, he kind of started started the trend of finding very efficient ways of doing that. So the JJ04 uh, only has four extra wheels. So it's 18 extra parts, but only four extra wheels to achieve that. So that means that, first of all, you can be really economical with your costing. So that's why the price doesn't go through the roof. And it also means like something on the Balcanto, if you keep it simple, you can finish those components really, really nicely. You don't have a load to, to finish. And again, make the price really high. So it's kind of a philosophy we've had. And it's something obviously we've done for quite a long time, but has come to the forefront ever since Belcanto. Um, and we plan to do more of those things in the future. This is all music to my ears, uh, no pun intended, with Belcanto. And it has been a year of massive successes and a year where collectors and enthusiasts that we speak to, listeners to the show, followers of ours on Instagram, people that email in, they have now seen Christopher Ward as a viable brand to have something to talk about on the wrist. Whereas before, it was more the value proposition, it was the high quality for the low cost. The game has changed. And Bill Canto, 12, and now this. I just can't wait to see what episode 4 is going to be like. But before we go, I, I want to talk about the party piece at night time because you can't really see the flex, the glitter in the glass, but you can see something else and it's pretty astonishing what you've managed to achieve. So do you want to tell us about the actual moon itself? Yes, yeah, so the moon is made of a, a global light material, so it's a mixture of ceramic and um, superluminova, so it means that you can cast that superluminova, you can get a 3D moon essentially. So the moon on this new watch is domed also, so you get a little bit more 3D nature to it. But it also means that it glows for longer because with a loom, it's all about the amount of loom that you have and the density of it, which allows it to, to shine brighter and for longer. So having that kind of dense ceramic piece means that it's very vibrant when it shines. So uh, this uh, this moon glows white instead of it was green on previous moon phases. We thought there was a little bit of a disconnect. Why Why is a moon glowing green? Um, it should probably glow white like the actual moon. So that's something we did for this one. And we also increased the size of it. So something um, I didn't really mention before, but uh, on previous moon phases or the moon glow in particular, we had the radial date. So we decided not to do that this time, which meant we could make the moon disk even bigger. So the moon is then 20% larger than it used to be. It's also slightly whiter. So the lighter the color, also the better it looms. Stacked all these things on top of each other. So the luminescence of, of that moon is, is the best of anything we've done. Initially, with most luminescent materials it could be super luminova it could be the variations used by it could be chromolite from rolex could be anything at all you get this immediate surge of high intensity power and then it backs off and then it kind of trickles so it's like this kind of bell curve with yours it doesn't do that it doesn't immediately have that massive glow it just seems to envelop the light around it, capture it, and then release it at a consistent and steady state throughout the night. Again, fantastic and exactly what you want. Reminds me of a chat I had with Mike France when you had one of your concept watches that again had that kind of ceramic, uh, I can't remember which one it was, it was one that looked like a orange and blue pinball machine. Yeah, it's the C60 concept. That was the one maybe two or three years ago, and that was the first time I'd been introduced to the global light material, where as you say, it's a cast lump of the material itself it's not a paint it's not applied or a sticker or anything like that now we get to the bottom line we get to the price and this is where i think you're going to absolutely blow everyone away so tell us how much this watch actually costs price on a strap is uh 1995 and on a bracelet it's 2120 that is incredible and that, again, is going to win you favours with the fans that already exist for Christopher Ward and new people just being introduced. Because, like I said, the only giveaway on the entire watch, and it wasn't a giveaway because people didn't even recognise the logo, the only giveaway was the Christopher Ward emblem adorning the crown. That was it. Nothing else. So this is another surefire winner. I am going to put in some serious consideration as to if it's time to get into dress watches because... This could be the one I have eyed up, more expensive ones, because we're getting introduced to more things. We're getting invited to all these highfalutin events and I'm Mr. Black T-shirt guy. But this could definitely open some doors for me. So thank you for joining me. I don't think it'll be the last time because you're the second boffin that we've had from Christopher Ward and the first guy, he did well. You've done equally as impressive. So I think yourself or maybe 
maybe that other guy, Adrian, maybe if he's around for the third time, we'll have to see. But thanks for joining me today, Will, and all the best with this launch. If you want to find out more about it, just go to the usual places, Christopher Ward, the website, the YouTube channel, and Instagram, I take it? Yep. Perfect. That was an easy one. Perfect. Well, we'll let you get on to designing the fourth album. All the best, and we'll speak to you soon. Thanks, Ricky. See ya. You've got quite a collection of watches. I believe you've got at least one or two Moonphase watches as well. And you may have one on you, don't you? So let's uh, compare and contrast. And okay, there's quite a lot of differences, but let's have a look at this. Now, this is the Arnold and Son Big Perpetual Moon. Now, okay, I think... Off the bat, there's lots of similarities. Case shape is not hugely different. You have got that big aperture window there for the moon phase. Okay, this one has a precious metal moon that's kind of engraved to be, you know, uh, realistic to the moon itself. You've got more precious metal use in here as well. So I think we can argue maybe there's a little bit of difference when it comes to the movement in this, it is fair to say. If you look here, you can see that the movement is maybe a slightly higher degree of finishing. And this is an in-house caliber from Arnold & Son, which has the kind of really uh, accurate setting indication showing on there for setting the moon phase. Pretty much pushing 19,000. 19k for an Arnold & Son with that movement. And we've seen all the Arnold & Son watches over the past couple of years because they've been really good with us giving us access to all the watches ahead of time at different events we've been to watch some wonders geneva watch days potentially even in a few weeks time at dubai watch week but for 19 grand versus 1900 that is a huge difference and i would i, I love this little guy and i don't like dress watches and I've already got myself a Christopher Ward this year. So this is a real tough one for me. This real tough one. I don't know what I'm going to do. don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know if I'll send this one back, Dave, or if it will get lost in the post. But we should probably move on to talk about what you've got on the wrist. And it's not an Arnold and Son because that was on the desk. So what am I wearing? I'm wearing my Sega Design U-Series Blue Planet, which is this little beauty here. Now, check out the show notes if you want some more detailed pictures or if you are looking on YouTube or watching this on YouTube should I say you'll be able to see the video of it here this is a titanium cased version this is the one that won the GPHG prize and it is marked on the case back as the GPHG winner little display case back with something that's not my favorite thing which is the screen printing on the glass but they've done it subtly enough that you can still see through into that movement albeit nothing super fancy to see like you might see on some higher end watches that are commonly shown at GPHG but Really nicely finished case, kind of integrated. It uses a regular strap, but they've integrated it well into the case so that from the front, it looks like it's fully integrated. But from the back, quick release on there. Super easy to change out the straps if you so wish. You've got this really kind of nice laser ablated kind of blue stained titanium to show the seas and then the kind of laser, laser ablation on the continents. You've got a little kind of compass area, which is effectively where you tell the time from. So it shows you the hours and the minutes on the two, I guess, bezel-esque features, internal rotating bezels are almost like where you've got the outer one that shows the hours, which is fixed. And then you've got the rotating one with the minutes just inside of that as well. I think this is a great little watch. I think they sell for around about the thousand pound mark. Um, still available. There's been a few different iterations. They've done a steel version. They've also done a white and a black ceramic version. And I believe they also did an Earth Days version as well, which has got a couple of little tweaks on it. For the money, exceptionally well put together. And again, even if this hadn't won GPHG, this is a watch that really appeals to me in terms of the kind of aesthetic of it. Just a little bit different, a little bit funky. That is a really cool watch. And I believe we have got one winging our way to Scottish Watches Towers as I speak. And it is the black ceramic version with the gilding on. I believe it's called the gilding edition. And it is exactly the same as that, apart from everything is in a ceramic black with gold leaf. And I've seen the videos and I've seen the pictures of it. And it looks incredible. The way you describe that there, it's almost like the mad one that I've got where <laughs> instead of hands or instead of little discs, you've got rotating parts and you kind of read where the different points touch and that gives you the time. But on that, with the compass being almost the hour hand, you can treat it like a one-handed watch, like a Meister Singer, where you just have to kind of casually glance down and go, I know where the orientation is of the digits on a watch, therefore that compass is sitting at five, or in between the five and the six, so I can easily tell the time. Great looking watch. 
the one you've got there looks a little bit like an ache pod to me. Yeah, it definitely has got that kind of same feel and vibe to it. I have a couple of the ache pods that I got from back in their early Kickstarter days when they reinvented the brand for the whatever time it was, I think second or third time it was. We featured the first Sega watch that got sent across a year ago. It was, it was a year ago, and that was the X Gorilla. And the colour that they sent across then was the orange anodized aluminium. It had titanium, it had bits of carbon in it, it had a suspension system, and that was about £300. And I was just shocked, absolutely shocked and blown away at the quality. And not just on a superficial level, like you can get with AliExpress that you see from Jody's channel, where it looks okay, you put it in the wrist, it kind of looks okay, you pull it towards your eyes and you're like, ah, okay, that's where the corners have been cut. With the secret design, they stand up, they look great on camera. The camera actually shows all the blemishes in watches. If you're watching a YouTube video, even if you're looking at pictures on Instagram, it's enlarged on your phone screen and modern mobile phone screens have got better than retina quality. You can't see the individual pixels. So if it looks good on that and it looks even better on television, yeah, it's a winner. And these ones, that one you're talking about there, the Blue Planet with the titanium, £926, including that, on Amazon UK at the moment. And sometimes you can actually find discounts and deals. So yeah, get one, grab one. If you've never seen one in real life, but you like the look of it, you will not be disappointed. Absolutely. I agree with you 100%. It's nice when Dave agrees. He agreed at the end of last show and I was ending on a high. But we're going to talk about things that have been giving us a high this week and we're talking about legal highs. We're going to tell you what we've been up to because it's been a while since we kind of delved into the things we do during the week when we're not busy planning shows, looking at watches, writing articles, recording shows or editing shows. And I decided to make the best of the last of the good Scottish weather and took a trip down to Strathclyde Park. It was a very nice, not warm, but sunny day. And I took a couple of watches down to the loch to actually record some video clips, get some pictures and just had a really good bit of fun. We had all the autumn colours, the sun was bouncing across the water, and it resulted in a lot of good pictures which you can see in the show notes. On YouTube, I've been having a little look around. You'll remember we talked in the past about the McMurtry car, which was extremely fast. It was almost like a scale-electric slot car racer, and they took it to Goodwood either last year or the year before, and it did look like an RC remote control car. Well, there's a university over in Switzerland that have created what they call the world's fastest electric car, which means it must be faster than the McMurtry. And this thing can do 0 to 60 miles per hour, 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in under one second. Now, that breaks the laws of physics when it comes to traction of putting the power down through the contact patch of four rubber tires because it uses ground effect to suck the car down onto the, the level surface and then it scoots off. And Tom Scott, who we've mentioned a number of times in the show because his videos are super informative and educational at the same time and we always recommend to check them out. He's got a great video, it's about five minutes long, it'll be linked in the show notes and it's well worth a look. This thing is incredible. It's faster than anything I have seen. It's just mind-blowing. And funny video-wise, I spotted... It wasn't a prank so much as it was a misinterpretation. Some guys were down on a beach over in Ireland and they dug a hole out just as guys do when they're having a drink. They just have fun, you know, they create things, tree houses, whatever it is. So they dug this hole and they left it, but they filmed themselves doing it and it was all fun and games. And then it attracted attention and then the media got involved and the media came down and they filmed it as if perhaps an asteroid had hit the beach and created this crater. And inside it, there was just a random rock. And they pulled a scientist down who started talking absolute bollocks, saying that the rock inside had come from outer space <laughs> and had come in, it had impacted the beach and blown this massive hole. And he picked up the rock and said, yes, and if you look at this side of it, you can see where it's all burned as it's come through the atmosphere. Oh, and the news ran with it. <laughs> the news ran with it and made a big splash about it. And then the guys that actually made it and recorded their own footage went, what, what the hell's going on, guys? We, we did this. And it just shows you the lengths that the media and the newscape will go to without actually fact-checking things properly and all the hyperbole that goes with it. But this video is just absolutely hilarious. Did you have a look at it? I did. I actually watched both the videos you're talking about. The uh, the beach one, uh, I think I'd actually seen it on social media because I saw, I think I first saw the video of the guys who just were digging the hole in the beach and then suddenly it got followed up by this guy who was like, oh, outer space, rock. Ooh, 
And to round up what I've been up to, I was looking through some old hard drives and found some pictures. Not those kind of pictures, pictures we can talk about in the show. And it was actually images that I'd taken back in the day when I used to work for some car magazines. And these are around about 2003 to 2010, which is 20 years ago, when camera technology, digital camera technology, was guff compared to today. And I took a selection of these images and I was sharing them with people in WhatsApp, including some guys from the writers group at Scottish Watches. And some people actually said, oh, these are fantastic. Were these taken on your new camera? Which I got last year and is like... 46 megapixels and I said no these were taken on like a 3 megapixel Fujifilm S2 Pro they had this really strange sensor that was in a kind of hexagon grid so they said it was 6 megapixel it was only 3 and the images stand up they look incredible to this day so I'll include them in the show notes as well and it just goes to show if you've got good lighting if you take your wrist your watch your camera or your phone in front of a window or outside you're going to get some great results there's probably time that we chat to Dave about what he's been up to. So Ricky, uh, photographs of cars, you say, from a while back. Uh, uh, does this ring any bells from nearly 20 years ago? Oh my God, you found it. David found it in you the house. It? <laughs> he did. Oh my God. <laughs> August 2004 for the grand price of £2.95 for a nicely bound magazine. Did you get that for free or did you have to pay for it? I actually, I think, I think I may have bought this copy. Jesus Christ. We met almost 20 years ago when I was, as I say, involved with modified cars and doing magazine work. And uh, I ended up interviewing Dave and doing a feature on his car and then perhaps doing, there it is, and perhaps doing a spirited drive from the aforementioned Strathclyde Park down towards the motorway. Wow. Okay, that's a blast from the past. Here's me hiding here, but there's a reflection, so you just can't quite see me. Let me see if there's anything else. Well, there you go. That was a blast from the past, completely unplanned. Strathclyde Park seems to play a big part in today's show. And yeah, uh, definitely take some pictures of that. We'll include it in the show notes. Might even pop some of that crap up on Instagram, because genuinely, that is how me and Dave met exactly 19 years ago. I thought it was almost 15, but there you go, nearly nearly 20 years ago. Moving on to watches, Dave, what do we chat about next? Should we talk about the elephant in the room, that uh, little watch auction that maybe has been postponed? The little watch auction that couldn't? Yeah, we've kind of chatted about this a bit. We were one of the only media places to really draw attention to this, although we didn't dive in feet first. We were quite cautious because... <laughs> don't back a horse unless you're certain. Now, this is something we've learned from a number of years of being involved in the watch industry and the world at large. You kind of gain a little bit of experience through the years, and we've obviously known each other for many of them. Only Watch drew criticism and questioned an ire from people around about a month ago, start of October, due to a couple of people asking some questions and not really been furnished with the answers. Santa Laura on Instagram and Periscope obviously got involved because he's good with his investigative powers. Questions were asked, how has the money been spent? You've created, you know, $100 million worth of funds. How have they been utilised? And the guy was just kind of pushed to the side and he didn't like that. So he did more asking, more questions, got in touch with journalists. Nobody really wanted to chat until he started making a stink on Instagram. And then Only Watch released a PDF that we chatted about two weeks ago, which raised more questions than it really answered and he kept asking more and more stuff then we had Audemars Piguet pull out take away their fantastic looking watch they didn't say why and when they were pressed on the question they specifically said no comment it answers more questions than it doesn't there and then FP Journe jumped in and a bit of a he's my pal said oh I give full backing to look and this is where it comes in that if you don't actually know somebody and you truly never really know people don't back them. Because I remember when Horology House had their YouTube channel three years ago, thereabouts, or maybe even longer, everybody went to town and backed this guy because he made cool videos. He was all about watches and he was an absolute thief, proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. But lots of people went to bat for him. We didn't because we didn't know him. And as you've seen a million times on the news, when somebody does a heinous crime and they interview the neighbours, you always hear, Oh, they were so respectable. They're such a quiet, upstanding member of the community. You'd never know somebody truly, so do not bet the house on somebody that you don't know. And FP Journe definitely did go to bat on that one. 
then Revolution published an article that was actually very good. It wasn't like SGX where they were almost pandering to only watch saying, oh, well, you know, they've, they've released a PDF. They've answered all the questions. They're great guys. That PDF didn't quite say that. A lot of people again jumped in and said, job done. Job was not done. So the Revolution article that came out, that kind of pushed things along a little bit. And then later that day, only watch announced that they were, they said postponing the 10th edition. But we've been around the block enough to know that when somebody says postponed and they don't put in a date as to when it's postponed until, that means it's cancelled. It may come back next year. Things may be okay, but the 2023 edition of Only Watch is cancelled. Now, Dave, have I missed anything there? Because you've been following this story as much as I have. No, I think everything you say is fair there. You know, yes, we, we've we talked about it. We didn't say a huge amount about it, but I think it's also fair that neither you nor I are forensic accountants and... You know, we were not set up as a investigative journalist outfit. Therefore, we are only reporting on what we see out in the wider world, whether it was the Santa Laura account on Instagram, who was someone who has a vested interest. He has openly said that he has previously unsuccessfully bid on watches, but he just felt there was a lack of clarity and he wanted to push that. Ultimately, does he have a greater agenda? Who actually knows? Because, you know, I don't know him either. He was being as non-confrontational as you possibly can be whilst asking these difficult questions. He wasn't saying, you have done wrong. He's just saying, no, all this information's missing and it's not cool. Maybe could you give us some of this information? Which I think is, again, more than fair. I think for me, the interesting thing is Patek were the one who still hadn't actually announced what they were putting in. Aside from saying it was going to be something to celebrate Philippe Stern's anniversary, I've got a funny feeling, and this is very much supposition, that behind the scenes they've said, we don't want anything to do with this, uh, we are just going to pull out even though we've not actually officially entered yet, other than saying we will do something. I think that was probably the nail in the coffin. Certain people may have stuck their necks out a little too far, you know, uh, FPJ, for example, not sure whether that was a cool move to say, oh, we support you. I would probably have said nothing if I was them, but hey, I'm not them. And other than that, you know, as I say, it may come to pass that there's nothing to see here. I do hope it comes back. And if everything is legal and above board, it should come back. There is no reason. There's nothing that needs to be generated or created. All that needs to be done is accounts and information needs to be disseminated and disclosed. That can be put together in a few months' time, I would reckon. Surely, if it has all been managed to the way that it's been explained, all that information will be sitting in spreadsheets and databases. All they need to do is export it and give it to people. There's nothing to hide, so it should be super easy. Am I wrong? Time will tell. Time definitely will tell, but it's now time to talk about an email we had in from a listener. Do you want to read this one out, Dave? Absolutely. So, subject is, your podcast made me buy sketchy watches. Hi, Ricky and Dave. Enjoyed the latest podcast. As always, your mention of D1 Milano prompted me to ping you an email about how awesome I found them to be. My latest edition is insanely fun. The sketch looks like someone photocopied a cartoon NFT onto your wrist. Please see the picture. Seems like they're all sold out for now, but would recommend for anyone to buy something a bit different. There's also a black one. Reminds me of Tron. I've also got an ultra thin and I've tried on the automatic skeleton. Quality is amazing for the price, especially when you sometimes find them discounted at various online retailers. More proof that collecting can be fun without requiring remortgaging. Anyway, keep up the great work. Thanks for putting me on to the brand. Cheers, Nick. So thanks for that. And I agree. I think it's a great looking watch. I might ponder one when they become available again. Yeah, it's a cool brand. Barbara Plumbo knows the guys there. I believe it's a guy called Ricardo because that seemed to be the name that was floating around when we were over in Italy at the start of the year. She introduced me to the CEO, the founder, and he was doing a strange graffiti launch where they kind of took over an area in the exhibition at Vicenza Oro and they were showcasing all the new designs, all the colourways, and these watches have got a look. And if you're looking at the pictures in the show notes, if you're looking at YouTube, you will see what I mean when I say a look. But they also come in at an inexpensive price point and they add a bit of fun, a bit of flair. And if you can't afford a Tiffany... Patek, perhaps you could afford one of these when they come back into stock. And the sketch one, it is super cool. Definitely look in the show notes. It has been painted perhaps in white, 
and then all the edges have got a thick black bold marker line on them. So it's a little bit like if you think of AHA Take On Me, the music video from back in the day. It's got that kind of ink outline look. Yeah, really cool looking watch. Like the design of it. We are in touch with them. They've not sent us a watch to check out yet, but maybe, since we've talked about them here, they may drop something in the post box. Reminds me a pair of my favourite Nike Air Max ones called, funnily enough, Sketch, which are either all white or all black with the outlines drawn in either white or black in the reverse. And it's got that same vibe to it. Looks really cool. Almost looks, when you see pictures of it, like it, as you mentioned, isn't a real watch. Yeah, so show notes are your friends, as always. And our friends down at Veers have a couple of new releases. We got to see them at Global Red Bar a month ago there. And we were sworn to secrecy. As always, we saw Nick and his team. They were showcasing what was available, but they also had some hidden gems. And this is the first time that I have seen such an array of colour on a dial from a Fears watch. Nicholas and his team at Fears have released a couple of new Brunswicks. Now, the Brunswick originally was launched back in 2018 with the 38mm, slightly classier, smaller, dressier feel to it. But a couple of years after that, they introduced the Brunswick 40 which you can probably guess by the name, is a 40mm version. Slightly bigger, slightly chunkier, a little bit more sporty. Also was the first of his watches to feature the new stainless steel bracelet, which again gave it that more sporty vibe to it. Now, for this year, he has just introduced two new models. One which most folk would probably expect, which is a copper dial. He's done the copper dial in the 38mm for quite a few years now, but never introduced the copper into the 40. They've had blue, they've had white, they've had a few other colours, but they've now got a copper in the 40. Probably by popular demand, I would suggest. Looks really good. Great looking watch. The copper's always been a really nice, good looking salmony copper pink colour. Really love it. Probably to be expected. The one that most folk won't be expecting was the Aurora. Now, I say they wouldn't be expecting it, but the more I think about it, the more it absolutely fits the Fears portfolio, as far as I'm concerned. Mother of Peril dial. This looks outstandingly good. I love a bit of Mother of Peril. Not really something I'd ever buy in a watch, personally, but I do like the look of it. In fact, the only watch I think I've ever seen with Mother of Peril that I thought, yeah, I might go for that, was a Zin, and it was, I think, a U50 technical dive watch, black case with a mother of pearl dial. Really the wrong watch to have a mother of pearl dial, but this is a watch that should have a mother of pearl dial. The Brunswick 40 Aurora. Aurora, kind of playing back to the Borealis and those effects that you get in the sky at night when you see the northern lights. And, you know, the mother of pearl very much is reminiscent of that feel and vibe to it. Every dial will be different because it's a natural material, so you'll always get that little variation of colour, effect and pattern on there as well. I just think it looks absolutely outstanding. Price point wise, Copper Salmon is coming in at 3550 on a strap. The Aurora, a little bit more, 3850 so not a huge amount more considering you've got that Mother Apparel dial. If you want either on the bracelet, you need to add £200 to the price. Really, really love it. Just think it's great. Eta movement in there, as you would expect. Automatic, unlike the 38, which is a hand wind variant. You don't see the rotor, as it doesn't have a display case back on it, but the rotor does have the kind of customising and engraving on it as well, which I believe is the Bristol flower, which is one of those little things that Nicholas has integrated in various places on watches, none other than on the inside of the clasp of the new bracelet as well. So you see it when you take it on and off, but it's not loud and proud shouting about it when it's on the wrist, which plays to, again, fears having this understated elegance, which is their you know, buzzword, and it's fair that anything bright and shiny gets hidden. So it's there, but only you know it's there as well. I think this is a great looking watch. I could very much see myself with one of these Aurora. I hope maybe they do it in a 38, because weirdly, I do quite like the Brunswick 38, which is the size I have. The 40 for me, less so but this is a great looking watch. If you're wondering why I was smirking there, it's not because I'm laughing at the watch, it's because I received an email as I was looking at pictures of the watch on my phone, <laughs> and it's from, allegedly, DHL to say that a package is incoming. But I've never seen DHL using human face emojis in their links. Uh, I get a feeling that that might be a fraudulent phishing email, potentially. I mean, a little guy's head in the link there, or a little... <laughs> delivery icon with a human head in the top. I mean, maybe maybe I'm completely wrong. 
but when I do a message preview, it's got a whole string of characters that don't look like a proper URL. Very odd, that one. Right, back to the watch, because that's what we're here to talk about. And yeah, these were fantastic. They were unexpected. When we sat down with Nick at Global Red Bar, we got to see the usual watches, we got to see the current range, which is always nice to see. But then he opened the bag of tricks. Then he pulled out the two new releases. Obviously salmon is a colour, copper is a colour that's been used many times in the past, not just with fears but across the watch industry, Patek famously using it. But the Aurora with that mother of pearl, that look, that feel, it is completely different. It was like when we got our every watch, not only watch, our every watch auction together and Fears created a custom watch with a colour scheme that was like no other that had ever been out before from them. So I really do like these. It is definitely not the kind of thing that I would wear, the kind of thing that I would buy. My favourite Fears still has to be the Alliance collaboration that came out a year ago because that was where Christopher Ward and Fears kind of swapped teams. You know, they changed their jerseys at halftime and the Fears guys were working on the part Christopher Ward would usually do and the Christopher Ward guys were working the part that Fears would usually do. But coming back to today, a year down the line, these two, they show a different direction that Fears are taking. And it's not just Nick anymore. People always think it's Nicholas Fears. He has got such a large team now. He's got such a big premises, a showroom, at watchmakers, everybody, even marketing folks that can get the message out. And with these new dial colours, with these new iterations, with different sizes been available, it's opening up to a wider audience that is worldwide. And it was a worldwide collective that came to Red Bar and checked these things out. And we were paying attention to all the different stands, all the different makes that were there, and seeing how people were interacting. Because me and Dave don't really get the opportunity to shoulder surf and see members of the public, collectors and enthusiasts, and how they interact with the brands and the new releases. And the fear stand was just populated from start to finish. It's really been a pleasure watching Nicholas's business, that being fears, grow from really effectively just him himself and building out his team as it's grown. And this would be a good opportunity to end again on a high. We did last week. Dave was saying all the right things at the right time. He has learned he's going to get a biscuit and a treat today because he's been a good boy. But it's time to let you guys get on with things. And one of those things is to check out the show notes, obviously. Also check us out on Instagram at Scottish Watches or website scottishwatches.co.uk. Never DM us, always email us if you've got a question, a query, comments, criticism, good feedback, negative, positive, it doesn't matter. We'll like it all, we'll talk about it all and we'll chat about it on the show. So drop us an email, info at scottishwatches.co.uk. And if you're bored, if you have time, you can go through the back catalogue. Tons of great episodes, including fears we've had nicholas on a number of times since 2019 since we started the podcast we also had rich from studio underdog on explaining all recently we had alistair from the alliance where i thought the conversation was going to be about plugging the alliance and talking about the show and it ended up in a recap of roger smith's life so that is a great episode that you should check out and that's pretty much it so thanks for watching thanks for listening and we'll catch you guys again soon